Well, I am uh, very excited to have a helper with me today as we get our message started. Uh, this is Michaela Mays, one of our C3 youth students, and she's going to be bringing, uh, yes, you can cheer for her, go ahead. <laughs> she's great. Uh, she's going to read the scripture for us today, the scripture that we're going to spend some time in this morning. But Mac, before we get into the serious business, all right, Sammy mentioned that it's the start of spring, okay? So tell me, Mac. How excited was the gardener about spring? I don't know. You don't know, do you? The gardener was so excited, he wet his plants. <laughs> it's pretty excited, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, so let's stand for the reading of God's word today. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 10 is where we'll be today. You'll see the words on the screen. I invite you to open up your Bibles uh, as Mac reads to us. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into a sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. When Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Amen. You may have a seat. Uh, Mac, before you go, pretty amazing teaching by Jesus, not one that is often looked at or, or heard. Uh, so as you were reading through it, preparing to read it to us today, what are some things that stood out to you uh, that, you know, were of great curiosity to you? Um, what stood out to me is when Jesus says that we must forgive even when people sin against us multiple mm -hmm. times, but when they ask for forgiveness or they repent, we must forgive them. Yeah. That's and, great. Yeah, and not just once, but how many times? Seven times. Which is seven crazy, times. right? Seven times. He says even in one day, seven times, which seems kind of over the top. When you, I mean, seven, like, you have a brother, right? You have a little brother. Yeah. yeah. Is he in the room right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's sitting over. Like, seven times in one day, you know, that's, that's a lot to ask, right? Uh, it's interesting, in Jesus' day, um, the kind of common teaching of the rabbis, the Jewish teaching of the day allowed for a person to forgive somebody up to three times in one day, right? So Jesus might be playing off of that a little bit saying, okay, not just three times, but three times two plus one for extra measure, right? Seven times in one day. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty powerful statement that Jesus is making. Let's give it up for Mac. Thank you for reading to us today. So what we want to focus on today is this challenge that Mac referred to in our teaching, the challenge as people who have been forgiven by Christ, by the Lord, the challenge that is given to us to be forgivers, to forgive others when they wrong us, when they harm us, when they hurt us in some meaningful way. And I know for me at least, to be a forgiver is not a normal, natural human instinct that's within me. If left to my own devices, if left to my own ways, that's not my first reaction. And that's just me being very vulnerable and honest with you. Maybe I, I'm the only one here. I'm guessing not, but I'm guessing all of us can relate to that. Uh, I know for me, my most normal, natural instinct is to not forgive, but to react. It's not to give the benefit of the doubt. It's to presume guilt. My most natural response when wronged is to pay back rather than to pull back but I'm guessing I'm not the only one. Maybe it's why we love Westerns so much. Uh, how many of you are fans of the Western movie genre? Okay, a few of you, but even if you're not a fan of Westerns or old Westerns, we're familiar with the storyline, right? We know how the story goes. The evil, marauding posse makes life miserable for the innocent townspeople, but enter the sheriff, right? The sheriff. I even brought a sheriff's badge with me, right? Enter the sheriff with the sheriff's badge 
on his chest. He has come to right every wrong, to pay back every misdeed, to exact vengeance upon every evil doer. So you think back through Western movies throughout the years, you think about the great sheriff Wyatt Earp, who was an actual person, or fictitious sheriffs like John Wayne or Clint Eastwood, or perhaps the most famous sheriff of all, Woody the sheriff, right? Reach for the sky. And when the right has been wronged, when payback has been issued, we feel good that the movie has done what we feel like doing in our own lives. How many times have we seen that movie played and replayed, that storyline lived out again and again? But you know what Western I have yet to see? This is the storyline that I've never seen. I've never seen this storyline. The evil posse makes life miserable for the innocent townspeople, but then enter the sheriff who goes to the leader of the evil posse one-on-one in order to seek reconciliation upon which the sheriff, on behalf of the townspeople, extends forgiveness to the evil posse ringleader, and everyone rides off peacefully into the sunset. Never seen that storyline, right? And if I did, I would want my money back. Like, no, I'm not interested. That's not a story. That's not a movie we want to see. And sometimes, if we're really honest, it's not a movie that we want to live out in our own lives. We want to see people pay for the wrong that they've caused us. It's been said that the way we do this is in one of three ways. Either we pay them back to their face, right? They see it in our facial expressions. They hear it in our words, in our treatment of them. They're gonna know it. When they've wronged us, when they've hurt us in some way, we're not gonna hide it. They're gonna see it and we're gonna hold on to it as long as possible to their face. But probably more often, we pay people back behind their back, right? Behind their back. Maybe we're sweet and innocent to their face, but when they're not looking or when they're not listening or at least when we think they're not looking or listening, we talk about them, we gossip about them, we put them in their place without them looking, without them listening, we make them pay for the hurt that they've caused us. But even if we have the self-discipline to not pay them back to their face or behind their back, we so often do it in our heart. We refuse to let go We privately celebrate when they fail or when they mess up or slip up in some way. We look for the slightest mistake. We trip them in our imagination. But it's been said that this unwillingness to forgive, this desire to pay people back who have wronged us is like drinking rat poison and waiting for the other person to die. It's a problem as old as Cain and Abel. Jacob and Esau, even Peter the disciple comes to Jesus and he says, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister when they sin against me? Peter, thinking he's being generous, says up to seven times. Jesus says, no, not seven times, Peter. Seventy times seven. No limit, no end to our forgiveness. Here's the gospel truth that Jesus wants us to hear this morning. Disciples of Jesus must not give in to their natural instincts, but just as the Lord has immediately, preemptively, unconditionally offered us forgiveness, we too must always be ready to forgive. It's an unambiguous, unmistakable, common theme found throughout the teaching of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 6, we're familiar with the Lord's prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we do what? As we forgive others who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. But then Jesus isn't done there. He says, for if you forgive others when they sin against you, you will be forgiven. But if you do not forgive others when they sin against you, you will not be forgiven. Mark chapter 11, which is a parallel passage to Luke chapter 17, lest we think that there is some condition upon the forgiveness that we offer others, Jesus eliminates any thought of that, any possibility of that. In Mark chapter 11, he says, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, 
It's not just those who have apologized, those who have repented, those who are broken, those who acknowledge it. It's not even just those who know that they've hurt you. Sometimes we forgive people who are no longer alive, who are no longer in our presence. If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. And Jesus doesn't just talk the talk, but he walks the walk. While on the cross, Jesus speaks the words that we're familiar with. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And here in our teaching today, verses 3 and 4 that we just heard, Jesus says to the disciples, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. Now, this is an entirely other teaching. Jesus isn't saying that we just forget about what's happening. We don't do anything about it. We don't acknowledge it. We don't talk to that person that we don't seek reconciliation. No, those are steps that we should and could take. It's right to do that, right? There needs to be a sermon part two here, right, to talk about the process and the wisdom that the Bible gives us on reconciliation and how to work through that abuse and that hurt and that pain and that neglect. That's That's another sermon, Rebuke them. Yes, talk to them. Go to them one-on-one, two or three witnesses. Bring others along with you. All of those processes are sound and wise and good. If your brother or sister sins, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times they come back to you saying, I repent, here's the challenge. You must forgive them. The mandate to forgive in this text and throughout the teaching of Jesus is clear. But what I so appreciate about this body of teaching that's offered to us, verses one through 10, is that Jesus doesn't just give us the mandate, he also provides the means, the way that we can do this. And here it is. If you wanna forgive those who have wronged you, and I sure hope you do this morning, then we have to make three choices. First, we need to watch ourselves. Second, we have to ask God to increase our faith. And third, we have to remember who we are. So let's dive into it. First of all, if we want to forgive those who have wronged us, we need to watch ourselves. Jesus starts off this teaching with a healthy dose of self-awareness. Jesus starts out reminding us that our actions, our choices, don't just affect our own lives. We know this to be true, don't we? That the consequence of our sin is not personal, but is communal that it affects our children and our children's children, it affects our families, it affects our friendships, our work relationships. Our, Our actions don't just affect our own life, they significantly impact those around us. And according to Jesus, even more so those who are vulnerable among us, children among us. For this reason, Jesus, at the beginning of verse three says, watch yourselves, be alert, pay attention to the pain Pay attention to the disappointment that comes upon us whenever someone has wronged us. Jesus is deeply concerned that we as disciples do not allow our anger, our pain, our resentment, our hurt to destroy not only our lives, but even more consequential to destroy the lives of our children. Let me illustrate it this way. It's kind of an unusual illustration Preacher and author Tim Keller talks about four English words that are based upon the same old Anglo-Saxon word. The four words are these. The four words are wrath, wreath, writhe, and wraith. Now that word wrath, we're familiar with that word, right? It's kind of an old way of talking about our anger, the anger that we have towards somebody else, our wrath, our anger. The word wreath refers to a set of branches that have, and here's the key, that have been twisted together into a shape. Our anger can twist us up inside. The word wraith literally means to twist or to be tormented by our anger. Our anger not only twists us up inside, but eventually it demonstrates itself, it shows itself, it manifests itself in writhing ways, in outward ways. Now, this fourth word, wraith, is a word that we may not be very familiar with unless you're a Lord of the Rings fan. Then you're familiar with the word wraith. Wraith refers to a ghost. It's an old word for a ghost, a particular type of ghost, though. It's a ghost who is doomed to relive every wrong that has been done to them. As a result, their eternity is defined by their past. Watch yourself. Your anger can twist you 
and torment you to the point that your whole life, maybe even your eternity, is tormented by the past. Our wrath can turn us into a wraith if we don't watch ourselves. Now, but I don't know about you, but whenever I'm angry at somebody, like whenever somebody's hurt me or harmed me or wronged me in some way, whenever that's the case, the last person that I'm focused on so often is me. My focus is often on the person who has wronged me, right? I'm fixated upon them. But Jesus is saying, watch yourself. Be careful. Be mindful. Guard your heart. Don't let your wrath turn you into a wraith. The author of Hebrews says it this way, make every effort to live in peace with everyone. He later on says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. See to it that nobody misses out on the grace that you have experienced yourself. And make sure that no bitter root grows up within your own soul that causes trouble all around you and not only defiles you, but defiles many other people. Jesus knows that a bitter root can grow up in our hearts and can consume us and twist our perspective of ourselves and of other people. Therefore, watch yourselves, Jesus says. This leads to the second point. A disciple who is ready to forgive prays this regular prayer. Oh God, increase my faith. Increase my faith. Right, there's a moment of raw honesty in this teaching from the disciples that I really do appreciate. Jesus has just issued the challenge. You must forgive them, even if it's seven times in one day. You must forgive them seven times in one day. It's a ridiculous scenario that Jesus is painting. Let me illustrate it this way. Imagine I wake up in the morning and my son comes to me first hour of the day, and he says, Dad, Dad, I spilled the cereal all over the floor. It's an absolute mess. Cocoa Krispies everywhere, milk everywhere, it's, it's a mess. Well, you know, I went to church the day before, so son, I forgive you, it's okay. Mistakes happen, let's be a little bit more careful in the future. One, hour later, dad, I was drinking grape juice and it dropped and it's all over the white carpet in the middle of the living room. Okay, son, I forgive you, your mother on the other hand, I don't know. I don't know about that. Hour later, Dad, I was playing outside. I got dirt on my shoes. I walked through the whole house, and now there's mud everywhere. An hour later, Dad, I dropped a glass. It shattered all over the kitchen floor. Five, Dad, I flushed my Legos down the toilet, and now the bathroom is a pool of water. An hour later, Dad, I did this. An hour later, Dad, I did that. Seven times. In one day, I'm supposed to just let it go, just... Forgive, it seems so ridiculous, to which the disciples respond with honesty. Lord, increase our faith. This is impossible. What you're asking us to do, to have that much forgiveness, is an impossible thing, to which Jesus, in so many words, says, yes, it is. With with you, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. If you just have a little bit of faith, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, then you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted, plant in the water, and it will grow and sprawl before your very eyes. You forgiving someone seven times in one day, it's not going to happen. But ask God to increase your faith. Ask God to open the eyes of your heart and mind to more fully understand the extent of his love and his grace, to to really understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Increase my faith, Lord. Help me to know the extent, the power, the consequence of my own sin and what you went through on my behalf, Lord. Increase my faith, and you will be able to do the impossible. And you'll not only be amazed by what God is able to do through you, but others around you will see the grace pouring out from your life. Watch yourself. Increase your faith. Third, if you want to forgive someone who has wronged you, and again, I hope we're all here today desirous of that, then we need to remember who we are. So Jesus, in verses 7 through 10, finishes this teaching uh, with a parable. 
right? We've looked at several of the parables of Jesus. Here's another one that really needs to be placed in its cultural context. Jesus says, suppose one of you has a servant, a household servant is the word that Jesus uses there, and he's plowing the fields or looking after the sheep. Now, here's the context, the cultural context we have to understand. In Jesus' day, if you owed somebody a debt that you couldn't pay, like if you were in debt up to your eyeballs and there was no way out of it and you couldn't pay back that debt, there's no bankruptcy court. You can't declare bankruptcy, right? Like Michael Scott, you can't do that, right? There's no bankruptcy court, no way for that to happen. That means one of two things is gonna happen to you. Either you're gonna be thrown into prison where you're gonna spend pretty much the rest of your life, which we see that in the parable Jesus tells in Matthew 18, or that master, that person who you owe a great deal of debt to will show you mercy and give you the opportunity to work off that debt, to be forgiven of that debt. That's the situation that these servants find themselves in. They have been given the opportunity to work off their debt. So suppose one of these servants is out plowing and looking after the sheep. Will he say, will the master say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come and have a privileged seat at the table? No, of course not. Or will that master extend some special appreciation to this servants or these servants who are just doing their duty? No, of course not. So you also, when you've done what you were told to do to forgive as you've been forgiven, you should say, Lord, we are your unworthy servants and we have only done our duty. We have to remember who we are. If we're going to be a people who are a forgiving people, if we're going to be forgivers, we have to remember what Christ has done for us. We have to remember who we are, but sometimes it's it's easy to forget. I appreciate what theologian Miroslav Volf once said, who wrote extensively on the subject of forgiveness. Listen to his observation. He writes, forgiveness flounders. Forgiveness fails because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans and myself from the community of sinners. We do that, don't we? For example, somebody else in your life lies and it hurts you. They lie, you say to them, you're hurt by their lie. You say and you think about them, they're nothing but a liar. That's what they are. They're a low down liar. But whenever, whenever I exaggerate the truth, whenever I make myself look a little bit better than I actually am, whenever I tell a white lie to get out of the consequence, well, it's complicated, right? It's complicated when it's related to me, but we caricaturize them when it's related to them. We're guilty of this. When someone has wronged us, it's easy to exclude them from the community of humans, to see them as a human being created in the image of God with inherent value and worth. And it's so easy to exclude ourselves from the community of sinners, to think that we're somehow superior, that we're incapable of doing what has been done to us. No, what we need to say to ourselves, what we need to remind ourselves is this truth that Jesus lays out for us. We are his unworthy servants. We don't get to wear the sheriff's badge. Right? When, we, when we refuse to forgive, it's like we're taking that sheriff's badge off of the chest of God and we're putting it on our own chest. And we're saying we have the right to condemn. We have the right to imprison. We have the right to judge. But when we forgive, which the word literally means to let go, to release, when we, when we forgive, we're taking the badge off and we're saying, God, I don't want that job. Lord, I'm nothing more than your unworthy servant who has been forgiven of every sin, of every misgiving, of every mistake. We are his unworthy servants. Why don't you say those words out loud this morning? Say together, we are his unworthy servants. I want you to hear the word of the Lord, hear what the Lord says about us today. The Bible says that God has forgiven our wickedness and remembers our sin no more. Therefore, say it with me, we are his unworthy servants. The Bible says that God has forgiven the guilt 
of our sin. Therefore, we are his unworthy servants. The Bible says that God has not held our sins against us. Therefore, let's say it out loud, we are his unworthy servants. I love this. The Bible says that God has placed our sin behind his back. Don't you love that? God has placed our sin that once was in front of him because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, has placed our sin behind his back and he sees it no more. Therefore, we are his unworthy servants. And the Bible says that God has removed our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. Therefore, one more time, we are his unworthy servants, undeserving of his grace and mercy. And now to each one of us has been given not only the mandate, but now the ministry of forgiveness. It's not just a command to obey, but it is a ministry to maintain. Is it an easy ministry to maintain? Is it easy to forgive when others have harmed us, wronged us, pained us in some way? No, of course not. If you've been the recipient of abuse, if others have spoken painful, biting words, if you've been abandoned or forgotten, if you've been gossiped against, failed promises, it's not easy. But as my friend once said, forgiving others is the most difficult thing God asks us to do. But also remember this, forgiving others is the most difficult thing God has to do. I know that because of the cross. I can see on the cross how difficult, how painful it is to assume the guilt of somebody else and to cancel the debt. It's a painful process, but that's what Jesus has done for us. The Bible says if you confess your sins, he is faithful and he is just and he will forgive us. Your faith in Jesus declares you forgiven. And do you know what forgiven people do? They forgive. Forgiven people forgive. So who do you need to forgive in your life? Ernest Hemingway wrote a short story called The Capital of the World. In this little short story, in the opening paragraph, in the opening scene of the story, which is set in Madrid, Spain, a father who's lost his son goes to Madrid and he puts an advertisement in the paper that reads, meet me at Hotel Montana, noon, Tuesday. All is forgiven, Papa. That Tuesday, uh, his son's name is Paco. The advertisement actually read, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana, noon Tuesday, all is forgiven, Papa. That Tuesday, 800 young men showed up named Paco, prompting the local police to have to disperse the crowd. Now, Hemingway, in this kind of opening scene, is kind of poking fun at all of the little boys in Madrid named Paco. There were so many of them. It's a derivative of Francisco. But more meaningfully, in this little illustration, Hemingway is, is showing us the longing that so many people have to be forgiven, whether sons or daughters, mothers or fathers, friends or colleagues. The world is buried, buried underneath the weight of their guilt and their shame. May they hear from us, all is forgiven. Let's pray. Our Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us in Christ the sin that has been forgiven through your painful sacrifice. Lord, thank you for not holding our sins against us. Lord, increase our faith. Help us to be a people who are ready to forgive. May there be a name on our mind this morning, a person who needs to be forgiven. May we extend that forgiveness freely as we have received it. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.